Is it? Uh, first of all, I really, really want to welcome all of you. My God, you're about 200 people. And that's very, very exciting. And my job is to teach you everything about uh, telling the compelling story that you were afraid to ask in 51 minutes. <laughs> and so I'm going to do my best. I looked at the program, wonderful, wonderful things, wonderful meetings, etc. But I have decided you don't need another lecture. Uh, what you need is you need some doing. Because uh, as we say in our required core class 200C leadership communications, which some of you may have taken over the years in other forms, um, we're all very, very proud of Berkeley. We're all graduates of Berkeley, so go Bears. And we all feel a lot of pride about being the leading public institution in the world to say nothing of what Business Week said about us, which we're going to ride on that cloud for a good, good year uh, of the leading e evening weekend MBA program. But we are the only, the only MBA program that requires people skills, that requires storytelling. And those kinds of things. And yeah, plenty of classes in economics and, and finance and all those sorts of things. But we are the ones that actually require, can you become an authentic leader? Can you become an authentic leader? And what does authentic leadership mean to you? So just turn to your neighbor for just 30 seconds and just talk to them and ask, brainstorm the question, what is an authentic leader? What are the qualities of an authentic leader? Ready? Off you go. Meet your friends. <laughs> Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so because we're in such a large, large room, such a big, big room, and I don't know if there's a roving mic here or somebody that can actually help with, with the mic, but just, just stand up. In your mind, what are the qualities of an authentic leader? Or I'll speak really, really loudly. Empathy. Empathy, okay. Empathy, definition of empathy? Good. Walking in someone else's shoes. Great. Other things that authentic leaders do. Sir, in the back. Someone who lives what they say. Someone who is authentic all the way through. Just like all the leaders in the Fortune 500, right? <laughs> I love that. Somebody who is living their values. Somebody who is living their uh, values and one says, yeah, 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 that never happens in the corporate world. That's not true. There's a whole new wave of real good guys and good ladies who are living their values and they're getting the results to do with, with employee satisfaction, with less attrition. Look at the studies. I saw another hand. Yeah. Clear vision. Clear vision. People want to know where we're going. I think that self-managed work teams are wonderful after a work team has been together seven or eight years. And we can all self-manage it. But in the meantime, where are we going? And people want to know that, and they deserve it. Sir? Oh, communication. Yeah, it's got the... Just stand, stand, stand. It's got the plan, that's fine. But if you can't convince the people to talk to them, you're going to have to wait eight years. And you can't afford to. Exactly. Communication remains in the top three. Go in and do a workforce study. Pay your $250,000. Have a fancy firm do it. I can already uh, fast forward and save you a lot of money. They're going to say, there isn't enough communication around here. People do not communicate, tell us what's going on. People do not bring us up to date. 
the presentations are long and boring. Let's have another 500 slides up there, PowerPoint, and pass the no-dos and those kinds of things. And that I often do not feel listened to. That in a study that we're involved with at Berkeley, the four themes that come out so far from companies, both small and large, is that people want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be recognized, and they want to make a contribution. And so when you turn that around and you really probe it in the interviews, because again, I believe the live interview, people say, I don't feel seen, I feel invisible. I don't feel heard. People roll their eyes when I give my ideas. So I stopped giving ideas years ago. People want to be recognized. They're not looking for the retirement dinner. They basically want to hear, thanks a lot. That really meant a lot to me. I really appreciate you staying late. And people want to make a contribution. They don't want to be kept out of, out of the light in that way. So communication is a discipline. You do it forever and you never arrive. And leaders have to work at it forever. It becomes the most important business skill. And so I want to just tell you about five powers before I turn it over to my colleague, Doi Chansiparin, who co-teaches the leadership 200C class with me, but the five powers that we're working with in the program, obviously the power of presence, which we'll get to in just a moment, the power of communication. How strong is your language? Are you speaking the language or is the language speaking you? And what I mean by that is, are you sort of speaking an acronym, you know, the LLRD with the J51 and the 168 and the two five, what, what is that? Or maybe something like, I'm so happy to have everyone at the town meeting. I'm feeling energized. I'm feeling <laughs> motivated. This is truly, truly a moment. I said to my wife, a true moment of celebration. What's that? <laughs> Where's your energy? And that leads to the power of intention. What was your intention in talking to your audience? What was your intention? Okay, and what was your conviction? Do you believe in anything? To, to quote a colleague of ours, Ben Zander, in The Art of Possibility, when Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, he didn't say, I have a dream, I wonder if they're up to it. <laughs> he basically said, I have a dream with the power of conviction to move something forward. And then finally, the power of knowledge. But just one more thing before I turn it over to Doi. Power of presence. What is presence? Because it's one of these intangible things. I can already tell you it's in every single one of us. Every person in this room has a powerful presence if you make the choice. It's all about the choice. The energy is there if you make the choice. You're an introvert terrific. You're an engineer that couldn't be better. It's not about that. It's about the choice to truly show up and choose to be present is that choice. So what is presence? What is presence? Don't all talk at once. You better talk to your other neighbor. Turn to your other neighbor. Quick, 30 seconds. What is presence? Go. Okay, great. Good. Perfect. Perfect. You'll have more time, I promise. Just the tip of the iceberg. So, what did you hear? What is presence and what is leadership presence? The title of this workshop. What is leadership presence? Just take a chance. You already got an A. Yeah. How you show up. Sorry? How you show up. How you show up. Great. Being related. Being related. Good. And others. Being in the moment. Being in the moment. Listening. Listening. Good. It is very, very much all that, and those comprise the skill set that allow every man and woman and child, if there are children here also in this room, to motivate, inspire, and connect to your audience. 
It's a skill set that allows everyone to motivate, inspire, and connect to your audience. It's exactly what you people said, plus voice, plus body language, plus conviction, intention, those kinds of things. So I'm going to have a chance, after Doi's part, to actually engage you in a little storytelling exercise where you will learn some basics around storytelling, which can be used as a very, very powerful tool to inspire and to motivate other people. Every moment is not a storytelling moment, but every, but, but every moment you need to decide has to be some kind of moment. Maybe it's a coaching moment. Maybe it's a directorial moment. But when you understand the use of storytelling as an inspirational tool, as an educational tool, as something which in fact really builds the community, that's a great, great moment. Okay, do I have to turn it over to you? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You guys hear me okay? When Mark asked me to be a part of this event, I was so excited because first and foremost, I am a proud alumni and graduate of the Hospice School class of 2011. So yeah. welcome back, everybody. Now, I'm glad to see so many people show up to this and come back to this great institution. See, for me, I loved it so much that I never left. <laughs> Pretty much right around the time when, when I graduated from the school and I really was trying to figure out what, what I should do next with my life, an opportunity came up to actually teach here at the hospice and school in the MBA program. So now I have the privilege of working with Mark and all the other great faculty members here teaching the advanced leadership communication class to the MBA students. And on the times when I'm not on campus, I'm actually working with companies and corporations around the Bay Area and around the world with leadership teams and organizations to really work on what does it mean to be a leader, a leader of a team that is high performing and high impact, like the word that we heard earlier. I also work one-on-one -on -one as an executive coach with young professional all the way to senior executives who really are working on developing themselves continuously. And those are the kinds of people that really inspire me. So all of those things are the stories of my life that you can find on my bio, on my resume. Now, because we're among family here, the real story of what I want you to know about my life started long ago all the way back around the world in a country called Thailand, where I was born and raised. Imagine this little boy who used to sit in the backyard of his house, looking up at the sky and of the planes flying by, and dreaming of one day being able to go out and see the world. I used to look at that plane and say, you know what, one day I'm going to be on that plane and go out to the new world. I had no idea where I was going to be going, but I dreamed about it. The opportunity came April 1995. There I was in the middle of the Bangkok International Airport. It was buzzing with people. Right? My family and my friends were there to send me off on my first ever solo trip to the United States. I got a scholarship, and I was finally going to have the opportunity to go out and see the world. Now, everything looks good, and you're all excited about it up to that moment when you're about to say goodbye, right? And then like, my heart was literally beating out of my chest. And I had that moment of like, I don't know if I made the right decision or not. Right as I was about to walk through immigration, my mother came up to me and gave me a hug and handed me a dollar bill, one dollar bill. And she said, just keep it for good luck. And I also want you to remember, don't use it. Keep it with you. But I want you to remember every time you see this dollar bill, that this dollar will not mean too much where you're going. But I want you to know that this same amount of money can literally buy a meal for a whole family here. And I want you to recognize how valuable this opportunity is 
that you got, then most people will never have a chance to get it. And don't you dare forget it. And it stuck with me. And that's the kind of leader that I strive to be nowadays. I never forgot that. I actually framed up that dollar bill as back home somewhere because I didn't want to ruin it. But I didn't need that dollar bill to remind me anymore because that lesson that my mom gave me stayed with me. And that is the kind of leader and the kind of person that I want to be. And I really think that's what eventually drew me to the kind of work that I do today now. Where I really get to work one-on-one -on -one with somebody and really help them figure out what is the one purpose that they want to achieve? What is that goal that you want to achieve? Now, along the way, I was fortunate enough to meet other people who really inspired me and gave me an idea of how I could achieve that. I spent 12 years of my life right after college in the financial industry. I was a product manager. I was a financial advisor, a data analyst, customer support, all of those things. But it wasn't until I finally came to the Haas Business School in the part-time MBA program, evening weekend MBA program, while I was still working, that I met Dr. Rittenberg in our first year required leadership communication class. I'm so thankful that Haas actually invested the time and made us take that class. Because in that leadership communication class was the first time I realized how much talent and how much opportunities there is around me in that program. Right, Chris? That's exactly why I chose to come to this program in the first place, to learn from other people also. And it made me realize the power of stories that is within all of us. That in our day-to-day -day work, we don't always get a chance to really discover one another's stories, right? Because we start seeing the person who's sitting right next to you in that other cubicle as like the marketing guy, the sales guy, the product guy, the IT guy. But really, there's so much more than that. Because amongst our friends, there were amazing singers. I'm talking opera singer. There were amazing athletes. And I'm talking about Olympics caliber athletes. Incredible writers. And I'm talking like published writers. And you never had a chance to know unless you really spend the time to really share the stories with one another. And I remember this quote from Noel Tichy. You guys have heard of him? We, we read this book as part of Mark's class, and he's also a professor. And a lot of published work around leadership and authentic leadership also, where leadership really is autobiographical. Leadership is autobiographical because if I don't know your stories, I don't know who you are as a leader. If I don't know your stories, I don't know who you are as a leader. What you believe in, what you stand for, and who are you going to be for the people around you. And so in this short amount of time that we have today, here we are, look around you now. This room, I can already tell, has huge huge potential. And all these possibilities that are just brewing here, the person sitting right next to you, you never know, could end up being that next business partner of that new firm that you're going to launch one day. And it's all about connecting and really discovering the story. So then it allows you to reveal who you are, but also really understand who this person is as an authentic and inspirational human being. And I am so thankful for the opportunity and for the kind of school that Haas is that allows us to be able to do that and connect with one another. Mark's going to walk you through an, a short exercise to really start discovering some of these stories about one another. But I'm going to start with one thing that I heard a few of you already said, which is being in the moment, being fully present. And that's the first lesson that we learned when we went into the leadership communications class about checking in at any given moment in time, are you fully present? Now, there's like the physical part of it. You guys all showed up here, and you're sitting here, you're listening to me, and as far as I can tell, nobody's asleep, which means physically, at least, you're already present. Now, to make sure that 
mentally you're also here fully and not thinking about something else that's going on. I'm going to do a quick exercise that we all did in the MBA program also. Um, so before in introducing what exactly we're going to do, this is going to be a quick way for me to check to see it, who went to school around the same time that I did. So let's give it a try. Aha! Uh -huh. Aha! Uh -huh. There we go. There's one. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. OK, there's only one. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I know this guy. It's so here we go. <laughs> Good, now we get to learn something new together. So everybody, if I can ask you to be up on your feet, please. Okay, can you see me okay in the back? All right, I'm gonna do a quick three-part exercise of really getting you to be fully in the present. And also, let's bring up some energy because energy is very much the responsibility of the leader. You bring energy into the room, into the group. It's not a part of your responsibility. It is your responsibility. So let's practice that together. Three part call and response exercise. I'm gonna do the first part first. So whatever I say or do, just give it right back to me, okay? Let's give it a try. Aha! Aha! Good. Aha! Aha! And indulge me for a moment. Really just let these wings fly for a minute. <laughs> I know, you're all going to be sitting back down again in a minute, so just, just relax, just let it go. Nobody's grading you, you all got an A already for being here, so here we go. Aha! 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 There you go, aha! Aha! Great, all right, that's part one. Part two, let's step it up a little bit. I'm going to say hey, and when I say hey, I want you guys to clap. Yeah, so I'm going to say hey, you guys are going to clap, so let's try. Hey! Nice. Hey. 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 Aha. 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 Hey. 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 Good. All right. You guys are on. Excellent. And I saw some of you. Who who made a mistake? Don't don't be shy. There's lesson number two. Always be open to outcome. And here's the thing. I want us to remove within these walls here the word failure. We're all experimenting and learning together. There's no failure, there's learning. If you made a mistake, just come right back in and that's fine. It's the job of the leader to make it okay for you to make mistakes, so it's okay. There we go. Step three, I'm gonna clap. This time you're gonna say, hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you knew it was coming. Okay, you guys can do it. Don't sprain your arm. Exactly. <laughs> so let's give it a try. Hey! 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 Good. Now, when you guys say hey, all that energy and the projection of our communication is going to come not just from the voice, from the body, but when there's full alignment of all of that. Right? So I say hey! Or hey, hey. I want you to align the expression of the body and the voice together. So hey! Full, full hearted. Yes. <laughs> just like that. There we go. Hey! 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 Aha! 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 Good. Okay, I'm gonna split the room into half right here. <laughs> All right. So focus, because at some point I'm gonna come to you. So I'm gonna come to you. So here we go. Pay attention. Aha! 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 Hey! 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 hey. Everybody together. Hey! 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 Good. All right. So you guys are warmed up. Check in with yourself. Feel the hands tingling. I see a lot more smiling faces now. The energy is up. You guys are on. Chris, come on up here. Give Chris a hand. All the kids. He's your new leader. Take it away.
together. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hey. 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 Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hey. 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 All right. Just shake your hand. Thank you. Thank you. How do you feel? Okay. So, a couple of you may say, well, these people are really the man from Mars. But actually, if you're going to engage in storytelling, you need performance energy. So, in other words, some of you may have seen the wonderful late Steve Jobs uh, commencement exercise at Stanford. It was all stories. And it was driven by energy. The first story, I was adopted. I was adopted. My birth mother was an unwed college graduate. Second story, I was fired from my own company. And then the last one, unfortunately, was a bit of a prophecy. I was diagnosed with a terrible disease. I think I'll be OK. And what? The reason why that was such an absolute smash hit, it's used in classes, it's used in companies, because it's so inspirational, because what Steve Jobs did in that moment is he actually practiced a principle of authentic leadership, which is learning from your own life story. Learning from your own life story. You don't need to, in fact, do anything other than think about a lot of stories that have happened to you, happened to a cousin, happened to a child. Most of us have between 25 and 30 leadership stories in us that can benefit other people. Some of them are fabulous. Birth of a child, new job. Some of them are very tragic, loss of a loved one, loss of confidence. It's all leadership stories. And when you actually tell these stories, as No Tishy says in the University of Michigan, leaders that tell stories are simply better leaders because they're practicing another skill, which is self-reflection. That's probably, even though there's no such thing as a leadership formula, you know, Bill George, Peter Sims, Harvard Business School, Stanford Business School have actually said there's no A, B, C, D, E, stop the cookie cutter thing and don't write another book either. But there are trends. We heard them here. Building a support team, empowering other people, living your values, empathy, brilliant. And the top one from our studies, did you take time to self-reflect? Or were you in such a bloody hurry that you had to go on to the next appointment, 10 to 10.30, 10.30 to 11, 11 to 11.30? Where's your time to think about how that went? How was that? Powerful leaders take the moment to self-reflect. And they're not frightened to tell their leadership story. I mean, I have so many, I'll tell you a real quick one because I want to get you into your your stories, but one of my stories, if you can just close your eyes for a moment and just imagine a young director, 140 pounds, very young, thin and good looking. Come on, use your imagination. <laughs> Come on, dream a little bit. Yeah, that was me not that long ago. Okay. Anyway, quick story. I won the Jerusalem Festival. The play was invited to Harvard. I felt like I'd made it. I'm working the cast like crazy. I have MBA students, zoology students, and I'm working them 12 hours a day. They have no time to study. And I'm wondering, oh my god, when's it all going to explode? Well, it exploded about two and a half weeks before showtime. And the MBA students came up to me and said, um, Mark, can we take you out for coffee tomorrow night? We have to have a talk. And I said, well, let's talk now. I said, you know, uh, we can, you know, no, no, we would like to go out for coffee. We'll have a sandwich. I don't really want your sandwich, but OK, you want to talk to me. So the next, and I was very tough in the rehearsal. What, why can't I hear you? Why aren't you giving me 100%? Look at that body language, deader than a doornail. Those songs are off key. And anyway, so 
the next day I was so nice at rehearsal. God, that was great, Lily. And boy, Karen, that was magic. You know, I'm just like lying through my teeth, uh, hoping that they'd stay. Five o'clock comes, they said, you ready to go? I said, no, I don't want to go anywhere, it's too cold. First of all, Cambridge Mass is too cold for me anyway. And um, I said, let's stay right here. And they said, no, we'd really like to go out. I said, look, boys, just say it. I'm too tough. You're having problems with your studies. You want to drop out. You're going to quit. And it's going to really, really, really take me down. But man, I'm a survivor. I'll get through it. And he says, what are you talking about? I said, you're quitting. Come on, stand there. You're quitting. He says, who's quitting? We came to tell you that this was a very powerful leadership development process in your rehearsal, and we have 600 bucks saved, and would you come to Soldiers Field and teach this to our friends? I said, what to your friends? The voice, the body, the storytelling. We love it. I said, so you're not angry with, with me? No, and you're not quitting. God, I love you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that was my own story, and my learning from that story is Stop judging what's going to happen in the future. Stop thinking you know what people are thinking. Stop thinking you know how it's all going to end up. Be open to outcome. Show up and be present. Be open to outcome. Come from heart and meaning. Don't be so scared that everything's going to go this way. So what I'd like to do now is that, are you all sitting next to strangers? No. Yes, no? OK, stand up. Stand up. On the count of 10, I need you sitting next to a stranger. I'm going to close my eyes. Go. One, two, move, move, move. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Be seated, be seated, be seated. Great. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Wherever you find, you're doing great. Okay, be seated. You want to sit here, you want to sit on the floor, it's fine. You ready? Okay. So, here is the UC Berkeley. Sit anywhere you like, sit on the sides here, come up here, you can do whatever you, you feel like. We're very, very much family here. And people are shaking hands, don't fall in love, do me a favor, just like keep it all very cordial. But the main deal here, well, I often say, could you get into partners and at Berkeley, you never know what, what, what's gonna happen, you know? Anyway, I'm gonna give you three storytelling techniques that if you follow that with your energy and with what my friend said here, coming fully present, coming full-hearted, with open-heartedness, without your head playing a number, come with your heart, this is heart work. You follow these three things, you're gonna get a decent story and we're gonna try it out now. The three things, I'm gonna start from the back. Vocal variety, what is vocal variety? Hello, come on. Thank you, I love you. What's your name? Andrea. Andrea right, got it. Bingo. A plus. Intonation. Intonation. So you remember from the king's speech, when he was working with the king of England to try to stop the stuttering, he started with a wonderful, wonderful Shakespeare line from The Tempest with Caliban saying, be not afeard. He didn't say, be not afeard. Be not afeard, the aisle is full of noises. No, it was command. Be not afeard, and now with joy. The aisle is full of noises. Try that with joy. Come on. Come on, joy. The aisle is full of noises. The aisle is full of noises. One says, well, I don't feel so happy, professor. How do you get there? Think of something that makes you happy, your child, your daughter, your dinner, whatever's going to happen tonight. Just think happy and say, the aisle is full of noises. Good, and now very, very, very soothing. Sounds and sweet airs. Sounds and sweet airs. 
That's not soothing, my God. I don't feel any better. Come on, think of something that makes you feel better. Sounds and sweet airs. Sounds and sweet airs. And now, reassurance. To give delight. To give, give delight. To give delight. And hurt not. Command. Be not afeard. Be not afeard. Be not afeard. Be not afeard. Joy. The aisle is full of noises. The aisle is full of noises. Sounds and sweet air. Yeah, make it a little bit seductive too. Sounds and sweet airs. Oh, you got that very quickly, didn't you? <laughs> that give delight and hurt not. <laughs> that gives delight and hurts not. <laughs> okay, so that's what you have. That's a vocal variety. Intonation. Intention. What are you trying to convey? Happiness, or are you trying to convey, I'm so proud of our company. Each time I think of you, I feel joy. <laughs> well, no, you don't. No intention. Second one, clear beginning, middle, and end. You get a, uh, what does clear beginning, middle, and end mean? Clear beginning, middle, and end. Structure. Sorry? Structure. Good. Structure. Start off, and we're going to give you the, the start. Start off with something Good, take us right into the story. We call that a ver vertical takeoff. Second, the middle. Keep it floating, ladies and gentlemen. What are you dropping the energy for? You can't last 90 seconds? Of course you can. I've seen you in the gym. You haven't seen me, but I've seen you, okay? And then the last part, the ending. What are you throwing the ending away? And that was the end of my story. <laughs> and suddenly the air is out of the, the tire. No, you keep it strong. Beginning, middle, and end. And then the top one is vertical takeoff. What is a vertical takeoff? Just try it out. Come on, you guys have been 100% so, so, so far. What's a vertical, ta vertical takeoff? Grab, Grab my attention, so do it. Do it. Sorry? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Once upon a time. Okay, I had a wonderful vertical takeoff because I spent a lot of time in South Africa. I love South Africa as part of the whole, this, the whole fight there and the whole thing. And now we're, we're building a whole new structure that hopefully will be positive for everyone. But I had this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Zulu South African woman. And it really, really happened. And we were on this trip to the Holy Land. And uh, so, you know, suddenly we get on these rafts down the Jordan River. And so, there I am on a raft with Tandi Masawena about to hit the first rapid. And she turns to me and says, Mark, by the way, is it okay? I can't swim. <laughs> you get, and we hit the rapids. You take us right in. Okay? Can you imagine a whole bunch of poppies. So in other words, the way you do it, take us right into the story. Joy and I would do a very quick one now, so you'll see it, and then we're gonna just try a, a bit, okay? So, the whole deal, and you only have to do 90 seconds. 90 seconds, I'm gonna give you the exercise in just a moment, but just so you'll see what it is that we're doing. You wanna go first? <laughs> I gotta think about a story. Okay. Well, I'll start. Okay. The way that we work with storytelling, we give it a very clear beginning. And the audience, like you, is very supportive. I can see in your eyes you want us to succeed. That's something we work with in leadership communications. Why do you look like deer in the headlights? Why are you hoping your colleague doesn't make it? The enemy's not in this room. Where's your enthusiasm? your nonverbal enthusiasm. So I begin bringing a curtain up. I'll tell a short, and then hopefully you'll support me. Or I might forget at my old age, and you also have to support me, so I bring the curtain down again. Okay, so I say curtain up. <laughs> curtain down, <laughs> okay. And so I'm gonna bring the curtain up and give you a vertical takeoff and a short story that would be one of Doy's leadership stories that he could actually utilize later. Okay? So it would look like this. Curtain up. 
Bangkok, June 2010. A school in the center of town. It is boiling there. I can barely breathe. And I have the great privilege of being there on a business trip with my great colleague. And he decides to bestow the honor of letting me meet his teachers. And we go and meet his high school teachers. And when he's not looking, one of them pulls me to the side. She says, let me show you a special room. Let me show you a special room. My God, what's going to happen in this room? I have no idea. We go in the special room, and there is a beautiful picture of Doi Charnsiparin with the first prize of the King's Scholarship, which enabled this great man and great teacher to begin his journey towards the United States and international work. And she said, how do you feel? I said, I feel proud. She says, never as proud as we will be. That's Doi, curtain down. Okay, here we go. Curtain up. Atlanta, Georgia. It was in a room just about this size. It was hot, the heat was soaring outside. As Mark stood there in the room, looking out into the audience full of women, and looking at them and realizing that just months ago, these women, many of them were living on the street. She didn't even have a home to go to. She couldn't find a way to, to even feed her children. She was on drugs. And there he was today, on their graduation day. All these women were brought to a center called Every Women Works, where they were given a second chance to finally be able to develop themselves and get that second chance in life for the opportunity that they wanted. And Mark was there to congratulate them and celebrate with them. And as one by one, the women came up and said, thank you for all the training and all the things that you did for me. Mark's trying to hold back the tears, and he turned to them and said, no, ma'am, thank you. Current down. Vertical takeoffs, clear beginning, middle, and end, focal variety. So here's your assignment, my dear friends, good-looking people. What a good-looking crowd. Jesus, you guys are really taking care of yourselves. Um, talk to your neighbor, assignment one. Get to know each other a little bit. Get to know each other. Don't, don't take notes. There's nothing to write. Just open your heart and meet your partner, meet your fellow human. How great. What a great moment. Secondly, share a leadership story that you want to share. Don't share something that, oh, I'm not ready to tell. Don't do that. <laughs> share a leadership story, a moment that has made you the leader that you are. Share a little moment, an event, an occasion, something that has contributed to you being the leader that you are. So it's now connection time, it's RQ, it's relationship building, it's SQ, it's a chance to live your values, it's a chance to be in the area of people development with your marvelous IQ, which I don't have to touch. There are four Qs, IQ, EQ, the people skills, SQ, live the values, RQ, relational quotient. You get those four going, you're unstoppable. So just connect with your partner and share a moment, a leadership moment, a life moment, a personal life moment, a professional life moment that has made you the leader that you are. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> You're going to have time. We're going to have to hear a couple of the stories. Look, we're talking about <laughs> close to 30, 40 hours of this work, and you just did it in less than one. So not exactly the same, but I love the level of concentration. I saw absolute connection. What was that like for you? 
because you've already done 70% of the work, the actual getting to know someone else. What was that like? Boring? <laughs> well, what was it, gang? Talk to daddy. Talk to the old guy. Inspired. Hey? Inspired. Why? Fun. Why? Stranger? Stranger. Okay, great. Others? Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Fulfilling. Fulfilling. Exhilarating. Exhilarating. Yes. Exhilarating others. Yeah. Surprising. Surprising. Great. Okay. Yes, hand in the back. I have a whole new connection. <laughs> Sorry? Feeling of connection. Nice. Okay. So, folks, one of the things, I'm not anti-technology, I'm just still learning how to use it, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> but in our technological universe, one of the things we have to do is we need more time for the human connection. The human connection. The human spirit is never boring. The human story is never boring. The human story is never, never boring. So we get to hear a couple of these stories. And what it is, this, this form of storytelling, where you hear someone's leadership story, you get to celebrate your partner. So you get an extra couple bucks here for your money. It's not just storytelling. It's the power of recognition. It's the power of appreciation, which I can show you in my studies if you really want to see them. <laughs> Pretty low marks around that too, right across corporate America. What's wrong with appreciating somebody? What's wrong with recognizing their struggle, their successes, their challenges? So I'm going to ask these two beautiful women here to come up. Come up, give them a hand. So any way you'd like to do it, you're already absolutely doing it perfect. One of you bring the curtain up, and you'll present Anne. Show up and choose to be present. No deer in the headlights and no judgment, please. Only positive energy. And you'll celebrate Anne, her story, and then Anne will celebrate you. When she brings the curtain up, be ready to support. Curtain up. So shortly after graduating from undergraduate here at Cal, Anne was a demo dolly, as she described it. She was basically the showgirl to software. And uh, she actually saw, when she was doing these demonstrations, the sales guys around her. And she's like, I can do what they can do. And she went to her boss and she said, I can do what they can do. I know the software. I know how to demonstrate its uses. And I'm really capable of being what they do. And so they gave her an opportunity to be a salesperson and join the team, and she ended up being the most successful person on the team. And so th her point with her story when she was telling me was about taking risks. No one at her company had seen her as a salesperson. She saw it in herself, and she took that risk and that initiative, and that led to a very successful career and one that she tries to share with women when she's talking and coaching them through their careers. And bring the curtain down. Curtain down. Well done. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, whenever you're ready. Curtain up. All right, imagine a Saturday night and you get the call and it's the tape recorded a survey person on the phone. Well, <laughs> that's what Lily does. <laughs> she works for a company that has the tape recorded people on the phone. But one weekend, they all came back to work, and there were voicemails on everybody's inboxes. They had more voicemails than they knew what to do with, and it took them a while to figure out what had gone wrong. Well, it was a new program. A new program that was supposed to do these calls, but if somebody hung up or finished the call, it shouldn't happen again. Well, unfortunately, it was the first weekend of this new program over and over again. The only way people could stop it was to unhook their phones. <laughs> So they got into work on Monday, they figured this out, they figured out why they had all these voicemail inboxes, 
and they walked through the process, they figured out what had happened, and they figured out how to fix it, both for their customer as well as all these people whose weekends they kind of ruined. Um, but the point of her story is that she tells this during interviews, and she's basically telling her new interviews or her new folks that she's trying to hire that in her company, the point wasn't to figure out who to blame, the point was to figure out how to fix the problem. And thus, that's the end of the story. Yeah. Sit, sit now. And acknowledge each other. And just acknowledge each other in some way. That's lovely. Give them a hand. Great, thank you. Here we go. Story, story, story. Here we are. Are you all ready? Come on up. Give them a hand. You see, that last one was just, I'm telling you, that was true celebration. And what I loved about it, I mean, this is not La La Land. I, I may come from California, but I left the beads at home. <laughs> Trust me. This is storytelling for a purpose. And that kind of thing, where there's a reason about don't give up, tenacity, come on, we can do it, stop throwing yourself a bloody pity party, we can all complain. We can all complain, but we can also all get through and create something unbelievable. Okay, welcome these two. Okay, so. Um, hey. So I want to introduce you to Pen Pan. Um, he actually grew up in China in Henan province, uh, he, which he said is, I believe, southeast of. Uh, Beijing. And uh, he grew up there until he was about five. And then, he'd, and then his father, um, who had actually been a translator, uh, got a job in Kansas. And so he moved the family to Kansas. And, and his father had the opportunity to um, go to school there. He brought his mother over, and then he brought the family over later. And then um, Pen Pen had an opportunity to live in different parts of the United States. And I think um, you know the key thing that he learned by living in these different places and coming across the different culture, you know, from China to the United States, was really just to appreciate the different types of um, differences that people have, but also to hold to his roots. And so he really does have a strong appreciation for, uh, you know, his heritage as it relates to China, as well as feeling very strongly about being, uh, you know, in the United States and a citizen of the United States. So. Um, that's his, that's his story. Great, you did great. You are fine. You're good. Curtain up? Yeah. Imagine you were born and raised in California. You're white, you're a woman, and you have 16,000 workers in China who just went on strike, and you're in charge of getting them back to work. Oh my God. This is Karen's situation. What do you do in that? And, and by the way, these 16,000 Chinese workers are working for a Japanese company. <laughs> Karen gets on a plane, flies over to China, having not visited the country before, um, but ha has a, a, a worldliness and a compassion and empathy for various cultures that she brings to the table and that she brings to the employees as well as the management team. Um, but first and foremost, you know, what she expressed to me was, my first thought was physical safety for the employees, was making sure that there were no riots, that making sure that um, people who had been kidnapped are returned home safely. It wasn't necessarily just about getting the factory going again. It was about um, making sure that everyone was OK. Um, the second thing that she said that really struck me was having to trust people without first knowing them. Being able to show your cards and, and really lay it out there for people, even when you don't know the result, being open to the outcome, and, and trusting that people are good. Um, and so when she told me the story about uh, being in a very new place, being in a very foreign place, having to understand different cultures, um, giving, getting people to work together under extremely tense circumstances, uh, it was very, very inspiring. Embry.
Can I do one more? Can I do one more? Mark to the group, may I do one more? Yes! Okay, where we are, right here. There they are, come on guys. Oh yeah, give them a hand. <laughs> Deep and brief, 90 seconds or less in your home. Deep and brief, more Shakespeare. Um, okay, turn it off. My friend, uh, Frank, he grew, he grew up in Florida, and um, when he was in high school, uh, he needed need to fill out uh, report cards for uh, exams. Uh, but once uh, the, he got the report cards um, all wrong, and, uh, which will seriously influence his um, exam results and um, it hurt his co uh, chance to go to college. Um, he was hesitating and uh, about if he need to take some measures to maybe uh, see what he can do with uh, the report cards to fix um, the, the, the problem with whatever measures he can take. But then he d decided to uh, make decision, and he, her, his parent um, told that you should take responsibilities for what you, um, your, you should take responsibilities and uh, face the consequences of your actions. So eventually, um, he decided to uh, deal with the facts and uh, then make whatever, take whatever uh, he can do to make up for the loss. And eventually, he go to. Harvard. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lemberg. Lemberg. <laughs> which is an important part. And, and so, that's, he learned a very good story. Uh, he learned uh, he, this, uh, this uh, very important ex experience of his life, and he learned a lot, which helped him to develop all of his important personalities later on in his life. Thank you, Curtin Dunn. Thank you. And, uh, well, no, I actually I have to apologize. Bring it back up. Bring it back up. Yeah. Yes, because because back up again. This is a side note of the story because I apologize. My native language is not English, and the, the environment was very loud. So I didn't. I think I made up half of his story. He told me. <laughs> and uh, because because the thing is, when the first time he say report cards, I thought it was sports cards. <laughs> And eventually, I was asking, what happened to your car? <laughs> <laughs> so forgive me if the story, half of the story is not what he told me. <laughs> no, that's great. Great. Take it away. So I met a new friend today. Um, and I didn't think I would have anything in common with just meeting somebody by chance. Uh, but we, it turns out we had a fair bit in common. Uh, as uh, little, little kids, we both were very fascinated with, uh, with computers. Uh, and we're introduced to computers early on. Uh, I grew up in a very middle class environment in Florida, which is by global standards, pretty, pretty nice living, pretty easy living. So you know, it was not something to get a computer and you know, the various gadgets of the day. It wasn't that big of a deal. Imagine if you lived somewhere in a family where to get a computer would take half, your, half the income for a year for your parents. That's my friend's story. So they actually made that sacrifice mm. to make that investment, to spend a half a year of their income to introduce him to this technology. And he was initially, like a lot of folks that, that get computers, interested in games. So he ended up playing lots of games. <laughs> His parents were probably wondering whether this was a good investment. <laughs> um, 
But they encouraged him, you know, well, instead of just playing the games, why don't you kind of figure out how the games work and how they're programmed, and maybe you can actually go and modify those, those programs. And sure enough, that's what he did. He figured out how to do that. And that the interest kept growing and the skills kept growing. And we fast forward. And he came to the United States. He got a PhD in electrical engineering. Went on to work for IBM. And I, I, I just like to think of what it's like for his parents, who still live in China. They come and they visit him. And just it must, I just imagine thinking of this outcome through their eyes. They made that investment all those years ago. And they can come and visit their, their son here and see the life he's, that, that that led to. Just think about it. Okay, thank you so much. That was unbelievable. What did you observe? What did you observe? Three great stories, there probably are 90 great stories here. Vertical takeoff, clear beginning, middle and end. Vocal variety added with gratitude, compassion, vulnerability, empathy. I mean, the fact is, is that every study proves that when the authentic leader is willing to express these feelings and allow these possibilities in the workplace, people are just fired up. They feel like they've come home. They feel like they're a community. What did you observe from the stories? And then I will wrap. Good listening skills. Great. You are? I love your hat. Okay, great. Next, yep. They related to each other in their storytelling. Related to each other. There was connection. You are? Hi. Everybody's got a great story. You have a great voice, that's great. <laughs> and you are? Okay, great. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. Uh, I really liked uh, getting in the mindset. Thanks, man. Yep. I like getting in the mindset that everyone here wanted me to succeed. It was uh, much easier for me to talk thinking that everyone is a friend and everyone is uh, happy for me and, and, and wishing me well. Fabulous. When did you last realize that you're not a passive audience member and that we need to support our colleagues? And when we do, again, I don't want to bore you with any more studies, but every bloody study in every school shows come in, do the exam, here's a cold drink, here's some cookies, you're a great kid, do the exam, group two, get in here, do the damn thing, get it over with. 20 point differentiating. I mean, each time. It's about to be treating people with some decency. Tough love, great. Set the bar high. But to be treating people with decency. Anything else? But you've been unbelievable. Adoy, last few words, and I want to give you a reading to send you on your way, and we will be over, and you get your break now. Martinis and whatever else they're going to be giving you. I think the biggest lesson that I took away from my whole experience here at Haas, and I still practice very much, is to not leave what you learn right where you learned it. It's a waste. It's only valuable if you're able to take that and incorporate it as a part of you walking away from this place and from this experience. So whatever it is for you this afternoon, the short amount of time that we have together that sparked something for you, take that with you. Don't leave it here. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. <laughs> we'll be here for any questions after, but I just want to tell you uh, I'm a very blessed character because I, first of all, get to work with 590 beautiful MBAs every year, vibrant, 
caring people. I don't have any interest in Generation X, Y, Z, Boots, Z, the other caring kids. Generous spirits, wanting to make a difference. Not interested in that other discussion of Generation X, Y, Z plus square. I'm interested in caring, empathetic, compassionate, beautiful, beautiful future leaders. I was very lucky because I got to interview President Clinton about Nelson Mandela uh, during a time that my wife was doing a wonderful series on the Mandela years. And of course, you know, the president, you know, seven hours late, that's his pattern. And you know, we're waiting there, the Adam Clayton Powell building comes in, melts us in one second, those blue eyes, I'm so sorry, that Arkansas accent, Jesus, I mean, you know, that's it. <laughs> and he sits with us, and we ask him the first question, Mr. President, who is Nelson Mandela to you? And you saw something truly stir in his being. He said, I could say fellow president. It's true. I could say special friend. But Nelson Mandela is my spiritual teacher because he taught me not to hate. He taught me not to hate. There is no living human being that I know of with more generosity of spirit. Coming out of prison, steps of Cape Town City Hall, I come to you as your humble servant with humility. How can I serve you? 27 years in prison, and how can I serve you? I have no hatred. And this was his inauguration prayer, which I'm going to dedicate to all of you, because you've really been fantastic, 180 people. We've got God, you know, it's a crowd. But you felt, like, you felt like an intimate family in this way, and I really appreciate it. So this is what he said, his inauguration day. Our deepest fear. He says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your plain small doesn't serve the world. Your plain small doesn't serve the world. You're a child of God, and there's nothing enlightened about shrinking, so other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We're all meant to shine as children do. And we were born to make manifest the glory of God that's within us. It's not just in some of us. It's actually in everyone. As we let our own light shine, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence, our leadership presence, automatically liberates others. Liberation from our own fear, our presence, automatically liberates others. On a great day in May 1994, when a country decided change was mandatory. Enough of the hatred. Move towards the future. So I want to thank you. You've been wonderful. And let's all bring the curtain. Hands up. Let's all collectively bring the curtain down. And give yourself a big hand.